All right. So it's a pleasure to have Professor Mukun Vengelator uh, here all the way from New York to give our week's colloquium. Um, Mukund was an undergraduate at MIT where he got his start in working with ultra-cold atoms. Um, he, he did uh, some work with Kleppner and Greytech and then uh, graduated with his bachelor's degree in 1999. Then he stayed at MIT for graduate school and did work with, his advisor was uh, Dave Pritchard and he also did some work with Mara Prentice at, at Harvard um, and did a range of projects involving uh, Bose-Einstein condensation, atom chip work, atom interferometry, and quantum optics, and graduated with his PhD in 2005. Um, then moved to the West Coast to do work with Dan Stamper Kern at Berkeley. Um, so Makund was a postdoc with Dan Stamper Kern, and was there until 2008. And since 2008, Makund has been at Cornell University um, and uh, has been working on a number of different research projects at Cornell, and he'll tell us about some of those today. Makun, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction, and also thanks for the uh, uh, invitation to come here and uh, share some of our recent results uh, uh, with you. So uh, I'm going to be uh, focusing this talk on some of our uh, experiments on uh, open quantum systems and uh, uh, some rather counterintuitive uh, uh, experiments and results that show the power of uh, a concept known as reservoir engineering to imprint or control various aspects of quantum behavior on an open quantum system. So, uh, uh, and. Uh, Part of my talk will involve my experiments on cold atoms, and uh, the rest of my talk will involve uh, experiments on what are known as hybrid quantum systems, which interface cold atoms with mechanical resonators of various forms. Uh, if there are also, if I lapse into cold atom-based jargon or terms, please immediately stop me and ask for clarification or questions. And, okay, so the kind of the schematic or the cartoon version of the hybrid quantum system that will be the bulk of my talk uh, kind of looks something like this, where you can imagine some kind of an optical cavity or a resonator uh, in which some membrane or some kind of a mechanical element is embedded. And this system, this cavity optomechanical system, talks through the conduit of light to a similar cavity situated elsewhere in the laboratory, but one which has in it a uh, gas of nanokelvin temperature cold atoms. And uh, this kind of an hybridization where mechanical elements uh, talk to cold atoms or interact with cold atoms through the conduit of light uh, actually has a surprisingly powerful uh, 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 kind of a behavior, whether it comes, whether it be quantum state preparation, whether it be quantum enhanced metrology or quantum control. And uh, it's really, for me, nice to come back to Arizona and show this as my first slide because uh, much of this work came about a, as a collaboration with uh, Professor Pierre Meister here at Arizona. So it's nice for me to come back and show all the results, uh, the seminal ideas of which really originated as a collaboration uh, here with Pierre. Okay, so just to get the terminology and the language right, uh, I, an open quantum system is a system or a quantum system that interacts with its environment. And you could say that's a useless definition because, well, all quantum systems interact with their environment. So to, ma to make this definition a little more useful, we can look at the time scales and say, well, we have the Hamiltonian that consists of some kind of a system, whether it be cold atoms, whether it be solid state defect centers, whether it be optomechanics. We have the environment with its own microscopic mechanisms which very often are not very well known, and we have the mechanism by which the system and the environment interact with each other. So now let's look at the actual time scales. In the one extreme, which we really like, which is the cold atom extreme, uh, we have some nanokelvin ga temperature gas confined with optical tweezers or magnetic traps in the deep inside a vacuum chamber and barely interacts with anything in the, in the uh, environment. Then we could say that the rate of the intrinsic or the intrinsic time scales, whether it be the 
uh, interaction energies, whether it be some kind of a uh, tunneling time, time scale of atoms in the lattice and so on, is very, th that rate is actually much, much larger than the rate, of, rate at which this quantum system thermalizes or interacts with the environment. Okay? So in this limit where the intrinsic quantum scale is much, much larger than the rate at which the quantum system interacts with the environment, it, and this ratio is much, much larger than one, we could say, well, to, for practical purposes, at least on time scales uh, involving the intrinsic dynamics of this quantum system, we can all but neglect the environment. And in this regime, I can write down Schrodinger's equation, I can write down uh, uh, Hamiltonian, I can pretend that the system, at least in the time scales of interest to me, is more or less unitary. And here I could say, well, this is a more or less an isolated quantum system. Okay. On the other extreme, where the system interacts and thermalizes so rapidly with the environment that this, we are now in the opposite extreme where the intrinsic time scales are very, very small, or where, uh, the intrinsic rates are very, very small compared to the thermalization rates, we would say, well, this is the regime of classical systems where the quantum dynamics in here, while it exists, is actually occurring on a time scale that's very, very, very slow compared to any kind of thermalization or decoherence mechanism. And here I could very well just write down, I could pretend that the system is essentially always in equilibrium with some finite temperature environment. And instead of a Hamiltonian which is, or, or a Schrodinger's equation, which is not very useful in this limit, I would instead choose to write down a partition function. I would choose to write down a free energy and treat the system essentially as a classical system. Okay? So these are the two limits. And in between, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be talking about open quantum systems where these two time scales are commensurate, where the intrinsic dynamics, quantum dynamics, and the rate of thermalization uh, with the environment are of the same order of magnitude. So we can't neglect either the quantum dynamics or the thermalization with the environment. Okay? So in this isolated quantum limit, I can write down uh, a Schrodinger's equation, look at the coherent quantum dynamics. The system typically has few degrees of freedom because I can all but I can essentially trace out the environment. And uh, you know, the isolation from the environment has its own limitations in how the system can tend towards any kind of equilibrium. We can write down some kind of a generalized Gibbs ensemble. In the opposite limit, we can write down a classical dynamics, free energies, statistical physics, and so on. In between, the system is intrinsically out of equilibrium because the system is never really thermalizing with the environment because the quantum dynamics is happening on the same time scale. And instead of, some kind of, instead of equilibrium, what this, such open quantum systems exhibit are usually dynamical steady states. And there's a very clear interplay between quantum coherent interactions and dissipation. And why is this interesting? Apart from just being kind of a crossover between one system we know very and understand very well and another system we un know and understand very well, uh, there is a fundamental curiosity of what happens in this intermediate regime. But it's also the case that a number of physical platforms, whether they be uh, cold ions and trapped atoms or optomechanical systems of various kinds, solid state defect centers, superconducting qubits, and so on, are somewhere in this regime where the time scale of equilibration and the time scale of quantum dynamics are comparable. And these are precisely the kinds of systems that are being uh, uh, put forth as promising systems for quantum information, quantum, quantum uh, sensing, uh, quantum enhanced metrology, quantum transduction, and so on. And the environmental influence on these systems is usually a, a bit of a nuisance in the sense that uh, you know, this, this environmental influence leads to dissipation, it leads to decoherence. That's why we keep saying quantum states are very, very fragile. Uh, it also leads to uh, a lower fidelity of quantum state preparation. It's very hard. It's, you know, as, we are, you know, as a cold atom physicist, we are rather spoiled with the ease with which we can create Bose-Einstein condensates or nano-Kelvin temperature gases. And when I first started working on optomechanics, I was taken aback by how hard it is to even get something as simple as the quantum ground state. Uh, you know, uh, and because of, and the main reason is because the dissipation in these optomechanical systems is just so much larger than what one is used to in cold atom systems. So not only does it lead to dissipation decoherence, it also leads to issues with quantum state preparation, cooling, and so on. And the ab our ability to c control the quantum state or manipulate the quantum state are also similarly limited by fluctuations, noise, and non-adiabatic processes. So what has been the solution so far to kind of uh, 
use these systems or harness these systems for various kinds of quantum technologies, the answer has been, well, first, let's look for new kinds of quantum materials, ones that suffer from less dissipation or less decoherence. Uh, let's look at uh, systems that may have some kind of a topological protection that are less, uh, that are more robust to environmental fluctuations because of various aspects of their topology. Uh, if it's decohering, let's just do the whole operation, let's just do the whole manipulation much, much faster. You know, why wait? You know, if it's decohering on a time scale of a microsecond, let's finish the entire experiment in 10 nanoseconds. Okay. Uh, each, of these, each, each of these proposed solutions has their limitations. Okay. Uh, and there's, you know, only so far you can uh, speed up the manipulation of various quantum processes before non-adiabaticity and other issues come to the fore. Okay. So, in a sense, what I want to show you in this talk is that there is a new paradigm, one called reservoir engineering, where we can say, given the control we have over each of these systems, we can take the system that we like, or the system that is amenable to certain uh, applications, or certain kinds of experiments, and use our ability to control the system uh, at, so as to impose an environment on it which has very specific properties. And in particular, if we impose the right kind of environment on the system, we end up this, the system with new kinds of dynamical states, with new kinds of uh, 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 topological properties and robust entanglement properties. Properties that the state or the system would not naturally have had, except for the fact that we actually tuned the reservoir or we created a new res reservoir or a new environment to surround the system. So this is a twist on, on saying, what is the quantum system out there that has the right kinds of topologically robust or robust entanglement properties? We can instead ask the question, given the system of choice that I want to work with, what is the environment I need to impose upon it so as to endow this with robust entanglement or robust topological properties? And like I said, as, as, as a uh, cold atom physicist primarily, my, my initial curiosity in these various systems is that it is a new regime. It's a regime where we have not been before. And it's really come, it has really come out of our ability to create new and ever more exciting designer quantum systems, whether it be nano-Kelvin cold atoms, whether it be these micro, uh, microscopic or mesoscale optomechanical resonators, or these Joseph's injection qubits, and so on. These are all artificial systems. But nonetheless, they, are, they operate in this rather curious regime where neither quantum mechanics nor classical mechanics as we know it is the full description. And so it's a new arena for macroscopic quantum physics. Uh, it probably, ha and I, I strongly believe, though it's still at this point, it's still a belief, that I believe studying these kinds of open systems will allow us to get into the microscopic basis of a quantum basis of thermodynamics and understand de decoherence, quantum measurement, and so on from a bottom-up perspective. Okay, and in our labs, we have uh, three experiments, uh, each of which started out with their own uh, agenda, uh, whether it be on cold atom uh, uh, experiments, on macroscopic optomechanical systems, or hybrid quantum systems. And right now, I'll describe a few experiments where we all, where we used each of these kinds of systems to try and access this kind of an intermediate regime with comparable uh, or commensurate interplay between quantum coherent dynamics and uh, thermalization or equilibration. Okay, so it's always fun for, to actually go back to the start and say how did we actually come upon this idea or how did we come upon this kind of a, 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 a field of uh, experiments. And for me, uh, we first started studying cold atoms in an optical lattice and even as a graduate student, I'd always been curious about uh, when I heard all these terms like quantum phase transitions and so on, I always, there's always a question in the back of my mind of saying, let's take something as well understood as a Bose-Hubbard model. Atoms in a egg crate shape potential or atoms in an optical lattice, and I can solve this model, and I can see that there's a phase diagram with very clear, distinct, uh, many-body ground states. When the atoms strongly repel each other, the true ground state is with a discrete number of atoms in each lattice site, in this case, one atom per lattice site, and this is what is known as a Morton Slater, a number state or a Fox state in each lattice site, and there's no transport. For weak interactions, the atoms are completely delocalized. There is long-range phase coherence, and this is what is known as a superfluid state. And what puzzled me was, well, if the, this is a quantum phase transition, 
will it still have the same phase diagram if I choose to measure or monitor the system while it's evolving? How does quantum measurement fit into this thermo or the macroscopic or many-body behavior? And so we developed a technique uh, uh, of quantum gas microscopy that allows us to monitor the atoms while they are evolving in this lattice site. Okay? And uh, unlike the other iterations of quantum gas microscopy, which can also kind of image atoms in the lattice site, the technique we developed allowed us to monitor the atoms as they were evolving on the, on the lattice site without heating them up, while still allowing them to retain or remain in the ground vibrational band. So they're still undergoing tunneling, but every now and then we can controllably measure their positions by sc scattering a single photon off of them. Okay. And the way this works is to uh, realize that the atoms in, that are propagating or evolving in this lattice not, just, not only have kinetic degrees of freedom, they also have spin degrees of freedom. So usually they are in the ground state, in the ground uh, vibrational band, and, low, and let's say spin up. This is the true ground state. And what we can do to each atom is to basically impose a two-photon transition that flips their spin in the same lattice site and then optically pumps them back into the ground state. Now the atom is where it started, but in this process it has emitted a single photon. And given that the atom is back where it started, we can just do the same thing all over again. And so each time we cycle through this process, there is a photon that is emitted, and that photon can be captured on a CCD camera. And we can locate or localize where this atom actually was. Okay? Is, is this clear? Is this technique clear? <coughs> and so by, the, by tuning the rate at which we flip the spin and cool it back in this cycle, we can get a larger and larger and larger rate of fluorescence from each atom, meaning that each atom is being asked for its position, or we are probing the position of each atom at a larger and larger rate. Okay? And so this is the same atom cloud just being probed or measured at a larger and larger rate. And you can see by the increase in fluorescence that the at each atom is fluorescing more and more rapidly. So now we have a system with two very distinct time scales. One is the rate at which the atoms tunnel. In the Bose Hubbard model, you call that the tunneling rate. And the other rate is the rate at which we are measuring the location of the atoms, uh, denoted here by gamma m. So intuitively, one can say, well, if, I, if gamma m, the rate at which I'm measuring the position, yeah, go ahead. Is this an all optical trap? This is an all optical trap, yeah. Uh, there is no, the only, the only magnetic field is to tune the energy gap between the spin up and spin down. Yeah, that's the Zeeman energy between these two. Yeah, and so we can make, uh, we can distinguish between spin down and spin, uh, sp uh, spin up because uh, spin down uh, has, uh, is not, uh, uh, okay. Uh, the atoms are incident with uh, light that is left circularly polarized. So this state, is, can, can uh, absorb or emit that light and be optically pumped into this state. So you have some magnetic field that's involved in this But this state is, is what is known as a dark state. Okay. So uh, this state will not fluoresce. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. Doesn't, doesn't the measurement, the fact that you're spatially localizing or resolving where the light's coming from, doesn't that influence the atom? Exactly, and that was the question we wanted to ask, is how, was that, uh, how does that influence the atom and how does it influence the Macroscopic or the many body phase. Okay, yeah. So, is this fundamentally different from or in some limited identical to the kind of weak quantum measurement that we could do in dispersive interactions? It is, uh, uh, it is very similar. Uh, I would say the weak dispersive uh, measurements one can do. Uh, if when one were monitoring the Larmor precession of a, of a gas through with off resonant light, for instance, uh, the Larmor precession itself is unaffected. So to first order, it, is, it seems like a coherent interaction, but of course we know that there is short noise, which causes the atom or the spin to uh, migrate out of the equator. Uh, so there is uh, longitudinal relaxation on a longer time scale. This in a sense is a lot more direct because once, uh, let me just go back, once, this at, once the atom is there, the way I bring this atom back to this state is by optical pumping, which involves the emission of a spontaneous photon. So at that point, the atom loses coherence. So this, okay, so that, that's the difference. Okay, this, process, this final process involves 
a spontaneous photon and that spontaneous photon carries with it a lot of entropy, okay? Because I can't control the polarization or the K vector of that photon. I, in fact, it doesn't even matter if the camera is switched off. All that matters is that information exists somewhere in the universe. Yeah. Okay. So the question we are asking is precisely, well, this act of emitting a photon localizes the atom because it's, it forms, it, it is a projective measurement on the atom. So how does that influence the, uh, the many body states? It, okay, it's non-destructive in a very specific uh, 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 term, terminology. I, I'm uh, here, the non-destructivity refers to the fact that unlike other optical or quantum gas microscopes, the atom doesn't raise up this ladder of vibrational states. It remains in the lowest vibrational state. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Th these are very good questions. Any other question? Okay, and the way we measured the location or the, the influence of uh, 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 the measurement on the tunneling process was basically by looking at a diagnostic that we use a lot in cold atoms, which is photo association loss, okay? And what, and photo association loss probably needs some explaining. Uh, basically, if I have two atoms in a single lattice site, now these are rubidium atoms and most chemists would not think about rubidium two as a well-defined molecule, but to a cold atom physicist, that is a molecule. And it turns out that a rubidium atom, rubidium molecule composed of one ground state rubidium atom and one excited state rubidium atom is actually intensely reactive. Okay. Uh, in a ground state and excited state uh, rubidium atom is a S level atom and a P level atom and they have a resonant dipole interaction, which means that they can uh, accelerate towards each other and that kinetic energy can, uh, is sufficient to kick the atoms out of the trap. So basically what you need to understand is that if I have one atom that's tunneling around, then usually nothing happens. If there are two atoms that are in the same lattice site and one of them happens to be in the excited state, then that forms an immediate photomolecule which is kicked out of the lab, kicked out of the trap. So basically I can look at incidence or incidence of or the rate at which there are two molecules or two atoms in a single lattice site by the rate at which the atoms disappear from my trap. Just by measuring loss, I can say if I start out with one atom in each lattice site, and as these atoms tunnel around, occasionally there are going to be two atoms in the lattice site. And if one of them emits a photon, then chances are both those atoms are going to be lost because it's a molecule, and that molecule is no longer trapped. So just by waiting for different amounts of time and then asking the question, how many atoms are left, I can look at how many atoms paired up, and therefore how many atoms are tunneling. Because to pair up, you needed to tunnel because you all start out with one atom in the lattice site. And so for very infrequent measurements, there's hardly any light. So there's hardly any, going to be any uh, excited state atoms. So you, you would assume that the number of atoms is going to be pretty stable, okay? Even though atoms can occasionally pair up, they're both in the ground state because there's hardly any light around. But as I now make the measurements more and more and more frequent, you would think, well, if the atom, when the atoms tunnel, they're going, to be, they're going to pair up and they're going to be excited by the light. And so the atoms are going to be lost at a larger and larger rate. So this is very much like the, uh, the infrequent position measurements or the weak pressure measure regime is a bit like this photograph where the, the cars are pretty sparsely spaced. Uh, they're moving around really, really quickly uh, and I can't locate them, but everything looks good and I start shining more and more light on them to see exactly where they are and usually nothing good happens. Okay. This is our classical expectation and the actual experiment uh, was that we, we saw that the lifetime of the atoms as we increase the measurement rate the atoms became more and more and more stable. They were living for longer and longer and longer times, okay? And the way to understand, and classical mechanics obviously, or classical intuition is obviously wrong here because what actually is happening is that as we measure the position of the atoms more and more frequently, we keep localizing the atoms back into its original lattice site. This is what is known as the quantum Zeno effect. That each time the atom is, emits a photon, it is projectively localized onto its lattice site. And if the measurement rate is much larger than the tunneling rate, then before the atom can tunnel to a neighboring lattice site, it's being localized again. And so the atoms never get moving anywhere and their uh, tunneling rate is highly suppressed by the quantum Zeno effect, okay? In principle, yes. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> In principle, yes. And so when we published this, uh, uh, so somebody told me that there's actually a Doctor Who episode uh, consisting uh, based on aliens who can't move when you look at them. And this was exactly the same kinds of physics. 
And so the, we had some fun. Apparently, there's a PBS program that kind of tries to pinpoint the rare moments of scientific clarity in TV programs. Uh, uh, and this was apparently one of those. Uh, okay. Okay. And how do we understand this? Uh, we can actually do some calculations. Uh, uh, I won't uh, bore you with the equations, but I think pictures work much better. Uh, in the absence of any kind of a, a measurement or uh, interaction with the environment, a single atom in this lattice site when left to evolve will have a wave function that evolves in this manner. It's the Bessel functions, but the thing you have to take away is that it's, it's basically a linear spread as a function of time. Okay, and the displacement increases linearly, and this is what is known as a quantum walk. Now, as I now start measuring or look occasionally uh, measuring the location of the atoms, what happens is that the atom begins to evolve and then scatters a photon which immediately localizes it back into one lattice site, then starts to evolve in a quantum mechanical manner, then bang, it emits a photon which localizes it into some lattice site, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is what happens in the influence of weak measurements. And of course, as I now make the measurement rate larger and larger and larger, what you see is that the atom is more or less localized all the time. Okay? And it never actually evolves clack, clack. It never evolves clock, uh, uh, quantum mechanically. And this kind of a behavior can be very well described by a purely classical diffusive equation. And the nice thing about our technique, given that it consists of the rate at which we tune the uh, rate of light scattering, and we can do that with exquisite precision, is that we were able to map the, the uh, evolution of the uh, atom all the way from the quantum walk, which scales linearly with time, to the classical diffusion, which scales as square, square root of time. And we could actually see that we have this quantum to classical transition as a function of the measurement strength. Okay. So if you turn off your lights and then turn it back on after a while, does everything else turn up? Yeah, yeah. And, and actually what we are doing right now is to actually build, instead of using photo association, which is, which is in a sense an indirect measurement of tunneling, we are actually building a high resolution imaging system where we can actually pinpoint each atom and then track that atom, and then say, if we switch off the light, it evolves, and then we switch it on again, and if you keep measuring it, yeah, exactly. And it's not just localizing an atom. Yeah, there's, there's two aspects to this. Uh, one is the lo actual localization of an atom. If, I, if there is an atom in a single lattice site and I keep measuring that atom, then that atom will st keep staying there, and that's a Zeno effect. But conversely, or the corollary to that is that if I initially measure a site to be empty, and I keep measuring that site, that site will remain empty. And that's a very interesting effect because what it actually means is that if I keep looking at this site and say it's empty, it's empty, it's empty all the time, what it means is that any atom that is trying to tunnel into that site will actually be reflected from that site. And that is a coherent process and that maps almost exactly to the dispersive measurement you just mentioned. And that is what is known as an interaction free measurement. In a sense the atom is not scattering a photon because you're just measuring empty sites, but the atoms are avoiding that site. You look at it and it doesn't register as a red dot on your camera. Yeah, but yeah, but but you you know those numbers and you can you can you, you can. Uh, in a in a certain sense, it's by post selection. What you what you typically do or what we did was to basically take the atomic gas and then just punch a hole through the center, and then by by beam of resonant light and make sure there were no atoms there. And then we would measure, we would, and, but the atoms would normally would want to come to the bottom of the trap. But if you just keep measuring the atoms more and more frequently, the atoms would never come to the bottom of the trap. And if you, do, if you just switch off the imaging light, then we would see after some time that the atoms are now at the bottom of the trap where they should be. So this is a physics proof that you see what you want to see. Exactly. And in more ways than actually one of the experiments that we are doing right now is something called entropy segregation where we take a, a very sparse gas of atoms and then we only measure in some regions. And if you do that exactly right, you can actually get the atoms to uh, diffuse in or percolate in and then stay there. So in a sense, you're actually creating a quantum detergent gas by the act of looking for it. So you're say, you say, I have a classical gas, now I want a, quant I want a quantum, I want a Martin Slater in this region, so I'm going to just look there. And lo and behold, you'll get a Martin Slater in that region. So. But the most interesting thing to me, which kind of uh, will segue into the rest of the talk, is that in this, in this classic quantum regime, I understand quantum box. In this classical regime, I understand the Fokker-Planck equation. But what was very, very interesting to me is that in this crossover regime, 
which I still don't understand if it's a transition or a crossover, and if any of you have insights, that would be really great. But in this crossover regime, we were seeing some very, very strange transport behavior, including what seemed to be a metallic phase. Now, if you open any textbook on bose hubbard model in equilibrium, you'll see that it has no metallic phase, especially when there's no disorder. And what we were actually seeing are phases that are not ex do not exist in the bose hubbard model, but we are seeing this on account of the fact that we are now introducing measurement or weak measurement into this. Okay? And so these are ongoing experiments, including a, measure, uh, as, uh, a demonstration of Anderson localization, where the disorder here is not classical disorder, it's actually photon shot noise. And that is predicted to have strange critical properties that are currently an open question. And these are ongoing experiments as well. But along this way, we then said, okay, now this, the, what was a very neat toy experiment on the quantum Zeno effect just became a kind of a bunch of questions. Uh, and let's kind of try to clarify those questions moving forward. All of this came out from a take a very well understood system, the bose hubbard model, and then start measuring it, which is basically to me just a euphemism for interact the system with the environment or a reservoir. And we started seeing new kinds of phases or new kinds of transport behavior. So now let's kind of broaden our horizons and say, in an open quantum system, are there many body phases that would not uh, arise either in the classical or the quantum domain? Okay. And what are the properties of these phases given that the system, that the, given that the open quantum system is intrinsically out of equilibrium, to what extent can our equilibrium phase transition theories like and concepts of scale invariance, criticality, uh, 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 spontaneous symmetry breaking, and so on, do they even apply in this intermediate regime? And it would be really great if the answer is no, it would not apply, okay? Can we create new states purely by modifying the nature of a system's environment? So we take a certain system with its intrinsic Hamiltonian and say now I want to create a new state not by modifying the system but by instead by modifying the system's environment. Can I do that? And in that sense, can we flip this discussion on dissipation as something to be avoided and says dissipation is actually a novel resource that one can actually harness for new kinds of quantum states or manipulation of quantum control. And this will be the rest of my talk. And the answer to each of these, in case you want to nod off, is yes. Uh, yes to all of these. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, uh, third you know, one person's reservoir is another person's system. So I'm confused by what you mean by that, because obviously you can engineer uh, an addition to the system, and then it, it acquires new quantum states. And but maybe you say, well, that's not a reservoir; that's part of my system. Sure. So, in a certain sense, you could say it's just a semantic uh, dis distinction. But what I will show you is at least in the discussion that I will go through that concepts like the fluctuation dissipation theorem and the establishment of an effective temperature. Uh, even if you don't know the actual properties or the microscopic properties of the reservoir, what matters is the uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem and the uh, nature of the uh, fluctuations or the Nyquist noise. That is the most important part. And those are typically things that you associate with an environment. To me, a system is something I have some knowledge about. To me, an environment is something that establishes a temperature or some kind of a chemical potential. And I don't need to know anything else about that. And those are the properties that really matter here. But yes, at the end of the day, everything is a system. If you know enough about the uh, uh, world, then it is a system in a sense, yeah. Okay. okay. And so to do this, we said, well, look, the bose hubbard model is nice. It, it's controllable. It's ultra cold and so on. But let's really, to understand the power of reservoir engineering, uh, let's just take the simplest possible open quantum system. And especially in an optical science uh, audience, this is something that hopefully you all recognize and say, yes, I understand this very, very well. This is just an optical parametric amplifier uh, where you can either have a down conversion of a pump photon into a signal and an idler photon or up conversion of a signal and idler photon into a pump photon. Okay? This is, you know, uh, hopefully this is very, very familiar. And uh, one can also phrase this in the context of or in the language of a phase transition in the following manner that if we say that for very, very weak pump uh, 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 amplitudes, 
the system basically is in what the, is in what is known as the disordered state. So basically, the signal and idler modes are just populated by noise or quantum fluctuations. And once I once the pump signal exceeds a certain threshold, which I'll call the critical uh, threshold for this uh, system, then I can generate spontaneously generate the signal and idler beams from fluctuations. And and those two states are uh, uh, distinguished by a breaking of a uh, symmetry. The symmetry here being the angle or the phase between the signal and idler. And so the phase diagram is really, really simple. Basically, at very, very weak uh, pump strengths, what I can see is something called I, the, 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 uh, both the signal and the idler modes are at their vacuum or the thermal uh, uh, limits, but they can exhibit what is known as quadrature squeezing. And that looks something like this. And once I keep increasing the amplitude of the pump above a certain threshold, then the signal and idler modes grow spontaneously from noise. And in a quadrature plot, that looks something like that. And this amplitude and this phase, uh, uh, or this uh, to be more accurate, this phase here is what is spontaneously broken. And so in that sense, I can, I can relate this to the language of uh, crit, uh, you know, uh, phase transition. Okay. Any questions about this? So this, and I, if I lapse into the jargon, I, I'm going to call this a U1 phase because this is this this is the, the breaking of a uh, angle or the break, the spontaneous symmetry uh, break, a choice of an angle here is usually referred to as just a U1 phase transition. Okay. okay. And now this parametric oscillator model uh, or the Dickey model, as it is sometimes known, has an incredible variety of physical realizations, all the way from the optics where the t in intrinsic time scales are nanosecond or smaller. Uh, to cavity QED systems consisting of atoms inside an optical cavity. Uh, and if you pump the cavity from the side, at some point above a certain threshold, you have a phase transition where you have spontaneous uh, generation or buildup of an ampli intracavity amplitude as well as crystallization of the atoms. And the system that I have in mind is an optomechanical system. Uh, uh, which consists of a membrane uh, pioneered uh, by people like Dahl Wilson, among others, a very, very high Q uh, harmonic oscillator. Okay? And this has time scales on the order of a second. And very quick, uh, this is kind of, I've also been educating myself about phase transitions. Uh, so this is probably saturates my knowledge of phase transitions. I'll share that with you. So the basic concepts of equilibrium phase transitions, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, basically at the point, at a critical point, you go, for, uh, be or beyond a critical point, you go from this parabolic free energy to something that looks like this Mexican hat potential. And this breaking of the spontaneous symmetry basically consists of the system rolling from this uh, hill down to this valley here, and it, it has, depending on the system, it has a choice of directions in which to go, and that is, the sp that, that is the spontaneous symmetry that is actually broken. And once in this valley, it can roll around in this valley with very little cost of energy, and that gives rise to the concept of Goldstone modes. And very close to the critical point, the system or various systems with similar symmetries and similar dimensionalities exhibit power law scalings of various observables like the correlation length, the susceptibility, the relaxation time, and so on. And these can be parameterized by various exponents that we call the critical exponents. And really, the power of uh, this kind of a language is the notion of universality that different systems with similar broken symmetries and similar dimensionalities can all be, uh, the observables can, near the critical point can all be scaled through these universal scaling functions. And this way we can relate, uh, for instance, the paramagnetic uh, to ferromagnetic transition in a whole bunch of different met metals, or indeed the paramagnetic ferromagnetic transition to the superfluid transition and so on because of the uh, similarity of the symmetries. And with the proper scaling function, we can get all these different systems to lie on a very, very similar graph. And in our optomechanical system, we can do all these dynamical steady state measurements, and we see the usual divergences of uh, uh, susceptibilities and relaxation times, and we can measure all these exponents very, very accurately, and we can verify, yeah, this is, you know, uh, uh, so far so good, that, that we can actually, everything seems to be working a lot according to the language of phase transitions. And now we want to, uh, let me just go back a bit. Uh, we want to establish a different environment. This is concept of reservoir engineering and say, well, what, how are we actually going to take this optomechanical system and embed a different environment around it? And we have two ways of doing it. One is to uh, interact this membrane 
with this cold atoms which happen to be in a different uh, 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 optical table but through the conduit of an optical fiber and the way this works is that the membrane is moving around as any membrane does or the any mechanical resonator does and that uh, uh, information is imprinted onto the light which then goes to the atoms and flips a spin. So this is basically mechanical motion to spin wave conversion and at some point later the spins flip back and the light goes back and now acts on the membrane as radiation pressure. Okay. And, the, uh, and this photon mediated fo uh, mechanics to spin interaction works really, really well and here is an example of a EIT transition in the spins mediated by mechanical motion and these were ideas all that uh, we got uh, working in collaboration with the group of Biermeister. So this way the spins actually act as some kind of an environment but an environment that has a remarkably long coherence time and that environment now directly influences the mechanics. Well, sure. I'm going to pretend I don't know anything about the atoms here. Yeah. So, how much photon loss can you afford before this basically just becomes loss out of the cavity? You must be doing really well here. Uh, like yeah, but we're also driving the cavity with essentially a classical uh, uh, light. So, so we are pretty strongly driving the cavity here. So, the loss does not matter too much. No, you should not. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, as as a kind of uh, I don't know how uh, if you've been following the optomechanics community, one of the kind of holy grails there is to get to a regime where a single photon exerts enough radiation pressure to to actually be visible. And usually, that we are very far from that regime. Yeah. Okay. The second method that we uh, uh, used, uh, oh, so this, this is actually one, the photograph of one of our labs. You can actually see the optomechanical, if you can, uh, the optomechanical resonator is somewhere here. We have a bunch of lasers as any BC machine does and some electronics and the actual cold atoms are in a different table over there and, and they talk to these membranes through this light and through this optical fiber. The second method we have was that, you know, given the quality factor and the intrinsic dissipation of these mechanical resonators is already really, really small, we can just come in with our own dissipation and our own Langevin force. And as far as this mechanical system is concerned, this is the reservoir that it's actually embedded in. Okay. And how do we actually do this? We take the system here, which is the mechanical resonator. We subject it to weak continuous measurements through this optical interferometry or this cavity. We record that quadrature components of that resonators in a computer, and then we compute in real time a kernel or the convolve the, the history of that resonator with this kernel of our choosing, and make sure we add the appropriately sampled noise and then feed it back into the system as radiation pressure. Okay. So as far as the system is concerned, this environment, this artificial environment obeys the fluctuation dissipation theorem because I'm adding in the right amount of noise along with the damping and is, behaves as though it is embedded in a system with a spectral density J, which could be completely different from its intrinsic spectral density. Okay. <coughs> so this is basically reservoir engineering through continuous measurement and feedback. And the particular uh, kind of environment I chose to impose for the rest of this talk is the something called the ownstein uhlenbeck process, which has this kind of a kern damping kernel. And what the only thing you need to take away is that this damping kernel is characterized by a particular environmental or the reservoir coherence time tau. Okay, so that's a, that's that's a, that's a turn, that's a number you need to be, uh, remember. And in the limit that tau goes to zero, you can basically say the environment has no memory. So that's the kinds of environments we are used to. Those are known as Markovian environments. They have no memory and they have, yeah, yeah, uh, they are able to respond to the system essentially at, uh, instantaneously. Okay? But if I make this tau or the environment's coherence time longer and longer and longer, this becomes more and more and more non-Markovian. Okay? And so here's the phase diagram. Here's the complicated phase diagram that I had shown you before on this parametric oscillator and now I want to ask the question, this was in the Markovian regime where the environment essentially had no coherence time and now I want to make the coherence time longer and longer and longer and longer, what happens? And what happens is that there's an entirely new phase diagram. Okay? 
you had the disordered phase with just the quadrature squeezing, you had the parametric oscillator or the U1 phase and as you make the coherence time longer and longer and longer, you end up with a completely different phase which we have right now for want of a better you know, kind of a nomenclature we are calling the U1 cross Z2 phase. Okay? What is this new phase and how did it come about uh, in the system? Okay? First things first, the new phase actually breaks or spontaneously breaks a time translation symmetry. Now this is not something that we normally uh, encounter in equilibrium uh, uh, phase transitions but something that has kind of recently come into prominence in all this discussion about time crystals. And the ingredient in those discussions on time crystals is that you need some kind of a many body localized state or some kind of a non-equilibrium state for this time crystalline behavior to occur. What we are saying is here's a disorder free system where we are seeing something akin to a time crystal. By the way, I don't really like the term time crystal, but I'll use it just because it's kind of become uh, uh, part of the jargon. Uh, I'll just call it a you know, spontaneous, but a spontaneous breaking of time translation symmetry just becomes very, very burdensome after a while. So I'm just gonna call it a time crystal. Uh, but this here, this time crystal is arising not because of disorder or many body localization, but because of this imposition of a new kind of a reservoir, okay? and I won't go through this in great detail, in too much detail, but uh, in open quantum systems, uh, one is, you, one is uh, you confronted with what are known as non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, or Hamiltonians that have complex eigenvalues. Uh, and these complex eigenvalues some, uh, are associated with something called an exceptional point, and this new kind of a phase, or this, MFA, uh, this time crystalline phase emerges when the exceptional point in the system coincides with the critical point for what that's worth. If for those of you who want me to explain that in great detail, just ask after the end of the talk. Okay? But that is a rather important insight for people who are used to non-Hermitian systems, that there's a new phase here precisely because the exceptional point coincides with the critical point. Okay? But we've been able to map out this order parameter of this time crystalline phase for the very first time and show that it actually has the right kinds of divergences. And I won't mention what the critical exponents are, uh, but they are not mean field exponents. They, uh, right now there is no theory that can actually predict these, mean, these critical exponents. And that's something that if you have any insights on how to do that, that would also be really great. But we can actually do these measurements and, the, uh, and measure the, the phase boundaries uh, very, and this is actual data, and this is, again, this is uh, some heroic experiments by my students because to actually do these kinds of experiments with the low damping and the reservoir-based feedback and all the other kinds of uh, uh, things that we needed to create in this hybrid quantum system, uh, all the different moving parts and so on, the, the membranes and the resonators actually had to be, these are room temperature systems which had to be stabilized to the precision of, a, temperature stabilized to the precision of 100 nano Kelvin. Okay. And so uh, the students really deserve uh, kudos for doing these kinds of experiments because the first iteration of this phase diagram looked nothing like this. And it was just uh, a couple of years of just uh, very nitpicky, pedantic uh, uh, work and that allowed us to get this kind of a clean data, but it's there. Okay. So this, you know, this phase uh, uh, has, a, a like I said, a spontaneous breaking of a continuous time translation symmetry and the frequency of this, you know, any, any time translation symmetry you kind of associate with an oscillation in time, just like a, a spatial uh, breaking of a spatial uh, or a space trans, uh, you know, a translation symmetry or, or, or you associate with crystallization or very periodic array of atoms. A time translation symmetry is associated with an oscillation. So you have a system that suddenly at some spontaneously beyond a certain critical point starts oscillating at some frequency which has nothing to do with the intrinsic frequency. And that's what's happening here. And this, uh, we can actually map out the order parameter of this oscillation frequency. And uh, uh, we can show that this is a, this is a uh, well-defined order parameter, albeit one with exponents that don't match equilibrium critical exponents. And most intriguingly, uh, the exceptional point, and, the criti and by now, and for this phase, the critical point, actually has topological properties identical to that of a Mobius strip. So we have, you know, if, if you went to a, an optics person or a mechanics uh, person and said a parametric oscillator has this kind of a strange topological property, they would say that's nonsense because a parametric oscillator is perhaps the simplest possible system one can have and it has no, top it has no topological properties. 
But by virtue of this kind of a reservoir engineering, we have taken a very mundane, almost boring system and endowed it with a kind of topological property that results in very robust finite temperature entanglement. Okay. And if you want an intuitive picture on how that actually happens, again, uh, ask a question, ask me a question uh, after the end of the talk. But just to kind of present the data, that entanglement of the robust entanglement allows us to get extraordinary degrees of two-mode squeezing. And so this is actual data where the orange dots are just a sample of maybe 100 iterations of the experiment just in a thermal state. And I'll show you what happens as we cross the phase boundary, uh, and that's the blue dots. And for those of you who are experts on parametric oscillators, you know that there's some kind, something called a 3 dB limit on squeezing uh, that usually occurs, and you can see that this is not 3 dB. Uh, we have gone past about 18 dB of squeezing in the system. Okay, uh, and yeah. I don't understand what, what is it that's being squeezed here? What it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's, it's, the yeah, it, it's the cross quadratures between the two signal and idler modes. The cross quadratures, so there are the signal and the idler modes in the parametric oscillator, and it's the cross quadratures that's being squeezed. P1 minus P2, P, P1 plus P2, X1 minus X2, X1 plus X2, yeah. That's right, it's a two mode squeeze state. Yeah? Say that again? The reason you can have so large squeezes is because we have a feedback loop. No, it's not. If I impose the same uh, environment with the same spectral density through, a, a through an innate mechanism or an intrinsic mechanism that does not involve uh, feedback, I would still get the same answer. It has entirely to do with the nature of the environment. It does not have to do with how we impose it. Your modeling supports that. Say it again? Your modeling supports that statement. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The only thing that matters is the speckle, uh, spe environmental speckle density J. And all the other results, uh, the, the theory results which match our experiments very, very well, uh, do not care about feedback. I, I was going to ask a similar question. I'm asked, you've artificially created the, this dissipation mechanism and so forth. It, have you conjured up any uh, physical realizations of that? Yes. That would be in a we have, yeah. Though it's it's a matter of it, quantitatively, they don't match the regime where we want to be, but qualitatively, they have the right J of omega. Yeah. Okay. And in, yeah. So it's a. So what what is getting entangled here? So, basically, if I, okay, it's not the two. It's not the signal with the idler. It, it, it is the bipartite entanglement is with a, with certain with with the cross quadrature or sa, a, a linear combination of signal and idler observables that is getting entangled. So if I were to imagine, if I were to uh, Im implement a any kind of a sensor, where what is the the uh, uh, cross quadrature or the sum or the or the difference in position of the signal and idler modes? is what is sensitive to my, say, a force, to an applied force, then that would be entangled. So it is very much a real observable, but it is not just the signal position with the, with the idler position. It's, it's, a, it's a linear combination of the two. Yeah. Here, the detuning is, is uh, in terms of the mechanical, intrinsic mechanical line widths, it's several thousands. Uh, I can give you a number. It's it's, it's mechanical frequency. So it's it's uh, the uh, signal to idler frequency difference is it's uh, it's about a tens of kilohertz. They're both megahertz range modes. Megahertz range mechanical modes. In some way, you you imposed almost the simplest environment you could come up with. Is, is there if you start exploring? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, that's one of the, th yeah. Uh, so I, let me just get there. The, uh, so the, a couple more things to mention is that by using this reservoir engineering, and these are results to be actually we are preparing for publication, we've also demonstrated uh, a kind, uh, kind of a, a enhanced interferometry, one where the uh, interferometric sensitivity scales as 1 over n rather than the short noise limit of 1 over square root of n. And this is also something that has been po postulated a while ago by people like Yerke uh, 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 under the name of a SU11 interferometer, uh, 
uh, one that scales with 1 over n rather than short noise limit. And we have actually shown enhanced force sensing using this technique. And the other aspect of it is that we have also shown very, very large degrees of cooling uh, using this artificial imposed dissipation where we are, we are actually showing how the intrinsic, the temp lowest temperature of these mechanical modes under intrinsic Markovian dissipation to be compared with the lowest temperatures under the influence of this additional degree of dissipation as well. Yeah. But these are not in yeah uh, you you uh, but these are not at the these are not in the quantum ground state. If these if the modes were at the quantum ground state, then I would call it Heisenberg limit. Okay, maybe later. So it's just a functional scaling that's one over n. So I would call it Heisenberg scaling, but I would not call it the Heisenberg limit. Right, and n here is the number of what? Phonons. Phonons. Yes, phonons in the signal and idler modes. Okay, so uh, so this is just a kind of a summary of what we have. I've given you a kind of a tour of uh, the, some experiments we have done using this technique of reservoir engineering, uh, and the uh, and, and like I said, uh, alluded to very early on, uh, are there novel many-body phases that can be seen in an open quantum system because of this interplay between dissipation and intrinsic quantum uh, dynamics? The answer is definitely yes, and these states have some very novel. Uh, properties including things like a time translation symmetry breaking and novel forms of topological ex uh, uh, excitations uh, which allow for robust finite temperature entanglement. Can we create new states purely by modifying the system's environment? Ab yeah, absolutely and, and now we can uh, start asking the question which is the flip side of kind of the hunt for new quantum materials or new kinds of topological materials. We can start asking the question given my innate Hamiltonian or innate system, what kind of new environments or reservoirs can I impose on it to create states with des desirable quantum properties? Uh, uh, and is dissipation a kind of a novel resource for state preparation, manipulation, quantum control? I think we have shown that you know, even in such a simple system as the parametric amplifier, parametric oscillator model, we can create all kinds of new physics, robust entanglement, and enhance quantum state preparation purely by applying the right kind of dissipation on the system. Okay. So now, of course, the imagination boggles of what kind of other environments are there that can give rise to even more fascinating properties. And these are uh, works to be published. So uh, I spoke about kind of you know the, our recent experiments on dissipation uh, and reservoir engineering. Of course, this is part of a much wider program that we have in our group. Uh, we really started out investigating these kinds of issues because we are interested in quantum nonlinear physics of saying we have isolated quantum systems in ultra cold atoms in the ultra cold atom community but by the isolation makes it great because we get to see quantum behavior but the isolation also makes it impossible for the system to thermalize with any kind of an environment so how do, how is it how how does thermalization work in an isolated quantum system and what kinds of new states are there that are protected from thermalization and we had uh, we still have some experiments and ongoing theory on that on the so-called pre-thermalized states and non-thermal fixed points. We have a kind of a really nice rich program on quantum simulation using optical lattices, looking at various uh, quantum percolation models, geometric frustration, and looking at measurement induced phase transitions uh, uh, into kind of Anderson localization or many body localized uh, states and a hybrid quantum system program on quantum enhanced measurement, this kind of Heisenberg scaling uh, 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 experiments and quantum control techniques and so-called back action evasion experiments where you can actually go beyond the standard quantum limit in various optomechanical or hybrid quantum systems. And much of this was actually in collaboration uh, with uh, the group of Biermeister. And one of the kind of novelties or enchanting things in this kind of uh, these uh, uh, research topics is how we have built, acquired ourselves some novel infrastructure or experimental capabilities in order to do the experiments that we are kind of uh, uh, motivated entirely by fundamental curiosity. And along the way, we come along, we talk up to somebody, and they say that, that you know, uh, who point out that the kinds of things we have built actually lend themselves almost immediately to various kinds of quantum technologies. And so uh, based on our temperature stabilization and so on of our optomechanical system, uh, we are collaborating with people who want to build quantum enhanced bolometers for heat, or for thermal imaging and so on. Uh, our optomechanical interferometry 
uh, drew a lot of attention from chemists who want to use it to study photovoltaic materials and scanning probe techni te techniques and study charge dynamics and so on. We are doing that, a bit of that as well. And more recently, I'm very happy to say that uh, as of four days ago, uh, we got funded by the NSF on a quantum leap program that where we are working with uh, uh, chemists and uh, electrical engineers uh, to use microtoroidal or nanophotonic uh, structures to interface cold atoms with solid state defect centers. So as to synchronize cold atom transitions uh, and, and a, basically a quantum transduction between cold, atom, uh, cold atoms and solid state defect centers like NV centers and silicon carbide and so on. So there's, there's a, all these offshoots. If you had asked me a few years ago if I would be doing anything useful in my research, I would probably have said no. But, it, uh, but it's really been kind of fascinating. And the nice thing for me is that all of these things actually improve these experiments much, much more, which is really, to me, the, it, 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 this, this, uh, this, I think, is a cycle in perpetuity. Because as we improve these, we get these, and this improves these. So that's a very nice place to be. And so the uh, actual, perhaps the most important slide of all, uh, the people who do these heroic experiments. Uh, so Yogesh, uh, Srivatsan Chakram, uh, Huya and Harry are the graduate students. Harry is a, is a bit of both. He joined my group as a freshman before he had even taken quantum mechanics. And now he's leading experiments on the bose hubbard model, uh, which is, uh, and uh, watching him grow has been fantastic. And a huge bunch of undergraduates. And the undergraduates really uh, get the impossible projects because I think of that as no risk. They play around in the lab. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it works, that's great. Uh, and they have done some really amazing work. So just in the past two years, uh, uh, Ivailo has graduated and is now working at Caltech with Manuel Endres. Uh, uh, Harry decided to stay on in my group, as I mentioned. Uh, Laura is at Princeton uh, working with Basim Bakker. Earlier is working at MIT with Martin Zwierlein. And uh, Minu is actually working at Cornell with uh, 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 Gennady Schwetz, who is a nanophotonics guy. So he kind of drifted out of the cold atom field. But the rest of them are kind of keeping in the cold atom community. And of course, uh, very generous funding from all these funding resources and our theory collaborators as well. So with that, thank you for your attention.